Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Though he never had the starry cachet of Cary Grant, Rock Hudson or James Garner, the good looks of Rod Taylor, at once suave and rugged, made him an ideal leading man both for romantic comedies and action films. Why was Rod Taylor the reflection of how Australian males like to see themselves? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Rod Taylor made his biggest impact with two starring roles in the early 1960s, in The Time Machine and The Birds, a film which seems to begin as a rom-com before mutating into a terrifying thriller. Then decades later made a memorable swan song appearance as Winston Churchill in Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. Regardless of the film genre, Taylor always came across as a man of action and charm in spy thrillers, dramas and romantic comedies. Rod Taylor was a welcome presence in television and movies for more than six decades. His rugged good looks and down-to-earth charm made him a sought-after leading man in the 1960s. He was the archetypical Australian movie star, fighting villains on screen and winning notoriety for his alcohol fueled fights off-screen. As an all-purpose Australian leading man of the 1950s through to the 1970s in Hollywood, Rod Taylor was the natural screen successor to Errol Flynn. Flynn has maintained legendary status despite or because of his scandalous private life as well as his sparkling performances on screen. In his prime, Flynn was almost impossibly handsome, while Rod Taylor came across as more of a regular guy. Bright-eyed and with a wide smile held in place by a strong jaw, there is an open-faced, slightly rough-hewn look about Taylor. A certain down-to-earth, can-do quality that he seemed to project. He was a good-looking bloke, on whom it seems there were no flies. Flynn and Taylor belonged to different generations, though they played a range of not dissimilar big-screen roles, from romantic comedy through to westerns and war films, from pirate epics to contemporary thrillers. Taylor arguably played a wider variety of characters than Flynn. Though he usually played American characters, complete with US accent, his roles showed a rugged, dashing character who seemed distinctly Australian or at least a reflection of how Australian males liked to see themselves. I'm about the only Australian in movies who doesn't pretend to be something else. Flynn's career was constrained by working within the studio system at Warner Brothers and limited for the most part to working with certain directors and co-stars. By contrast, Taylor's career, which commenced a few years after Flynn's death in 1950 and saw him work with a range of directors including Alfred Hitchcock, John Ford, Taylor, among others, was considered by producer Albert R. Broccoli to play James Bond, a role Taylor rejected much to his subsequent regret. It is not hard to imagine Taylor excelling in that role. Like the similarly hairy-chested Sean Connery, Taylor could be both personable and ruthless, suave and brooding. Looking back on his career, he told an interviewer that he'd had a sometimes wild youth. At that age, I was going all over the world working with the most beautiful people in the world and the most talented people in the world. It was just an incredible life. But his focus, he said, was on the future. I don't revel in the memorabilia at all. I'm interested in what's coming next. Rod Taylor was born in Sydney, Australia on January 11th, 1930 into an artistically minded family. His father was a construction contractor and commercial artist and his mum a writer of over 100 short stories and children's books. He studied art at East Sydney Technical College and painted backdrops for Mark Foy's department store. His interest in art never left him and he continued to paint and draw for the rest of his life. He became interested in drama and started doing radio work whenever he could. He had a role in the legendary ABC radio serial Blue Hills. He played pilot Douglas Bader in a serial adaptation of Bader's life story, Reach for the Sky, and he was a famous on-air Tarzan. Taylor worked for a while as a commercial artist himself, but changed tack after seeing Laurence Olivier in a touring production with the Old Vic. Sir Larry's performance that night clinched the deal. After seeing him, I knew I would never be anything but an actor. 
Taylor studied for a year at the Independent Theatre School, making his stage debut in a 1947 production of Miss Alliance by George Bernard Shaw. He worked on stage and on the radio. From radio he went on to theatre and film. He played an American character in his first feature, King of the Coral Sea. After he appeared in Long John Silver, an unofficial sequel to Treasure Island that was shot in Australia, its director, Byron Haskin, recommended him to Paramount's Hal B. Wallace. Taylor won a radio talent contest in 1954 and the prize included an airline ticket that enabled him to make his way to Los Angeles. He never really left, although it took a couple of years for him to establish himself. While many Australian actors of the time would eventually move to England, Taylor's journey quickly diverted him to Hollywood. He never made it to London and was soon to be seen on American television in such series as Cheyenne, and he was considered for the lead role in Maverick, which eventually went to James Garner. Taylor's first years in Hollywood were a struggle. At first, Taylor got by in bit parts in films like The Virgin Queen, starring Betty Davis, and Hell on Frisco Bay, starring Alan Ladd. He auditioned for the role of boxer Rocky Graziano in Somebody Up There Likes Me, but he lost out to Paul Newman. MGM was impressed enough with Taylor's audition to put him under contract, and he soon started getting better parts, such as his pivotal role as Elizabeth Taylor's high society boyfriend in Giant. Taylor's breakthrough came in 1960 with The Time Machine. George Powell's special effects marvel in which Taylor's dogged British inventor transports himself into a future where he witnesses world wars, nuclear annihilation and, finally, the rise of a new society. Powell had originally considered casting a middle-aged Brit, such as David Niven or James Mason, but needing someone of a more athletic and idealistic bent gave Taylor his first big role. The film is silly but thoroughly enjoyable fun, and Taylor makes Wells a dashing leading man who is equal parts geeky scientist and athletic swashbuckler. The Time Machine was especially influential on 60s television, establishing his dashing matinee idol looks rather than his acting flair. It would become perhaps his most fondly remembered role. In 1956 he was put under contract at MGM at $450 a week. He had supporting roles alongside some major Hollywood names in films such as Edward Dimitrix's Rain Tree County, with Montgomery Clift and Elizabeth Taylor, with James Dean. He was in Delbert Mann's Separate Tables, adapted from Terence Rattigan's play, which starred Burt Lancaster, Deborah Carr and Rita Hayworth. Two of its cast members, David Niven and Wendy Hiller, won Oscars for their performances. From there, Taylor reeled off a string of successes, first and foremost as the stalwart leading man in Alfred Hitchcock's classic thriller The Birds, possibly Alfred Hitchcock's final masterwork as he and Tippi Hedren were pursued by flocks of avian killers. He wasn't Alfred Hitchcock's first choice to play Mitch Brenner, the lawyer who falls for Tippi Hedren's socialite in his adaptation of the Daphne du Maurier short story about an avian invasion. The Bird's scriptwriter, Evan Hunter, recalled a conversation before the film had been cast. Well, the girl should be Grace, of course, but she's in Monaco being a princess, isn't she? Hitchcock told him. And for the man, Carrie, of course, but there are only two stars in this picture, the Bird's and me. But he was taken aback to be offered the role. I got this call out of the blue from Mr Hitchcock and was totally amazed, he recalled and being a brash young brat, I guess I didn't show any kind of respect that I was supposed to, and I think he kind of liked it. I said, I hope the birds and things don't kind of totally outshadow the people. Of course, that's the story. They're supposed to. But then we really talked about making movies and how I loved it, and we just got on extremely well. I was absolutely flattered and astonished. Hitchcock famously, or notoriously, treated Hedron, the model making her acting debut, atrociously during filming, but Taylor helped her through. Rod was a great pal to me and a real strength, she said. We were very, very good friends. He's one of the most fun people I've ever met, thoughtful and classy. There was everything good in that man. A supporting role in the VIP solidified his position as an international star, Taylor got to know Ford's favourite actor John Wayne, with whom he appeared in Burt Kennedy's Western 1973, 
the train robbers. To nobody's surprise, he became the star of a television action series, Hong Kong, which gave him an organised fan club, composed mostly of young women, and a fanzine, Rod Law. At $3,750 per episode, he was the highest paid actor in a one-hour show. Columnist Hedda Hopper listed him as one of Hollywood's 21 most promising stars, and Photoplay magazine called him a breath of fresh air in a stale air town. His contribution to the Renaissance, however, was somewhat limited. Off-screen, he continued maintaining Australia's reputation for hard-drinking, hard-living Hollywood actors. Professionally as well, he maintained his Australian link, expressing frustration whenever non-Australian actors were cast as Aussies. In all the rest, he complained, I've been a phony American. I want to make movies about Australia to be shown to people all over the world, he said during a home visit in 1968. It annoys me to talk to people overseas who are surprised we have not only kangaroos but telephones. I think I've built up a pretty good international reputation. I'm lucky enough to have some sort of status, and I want to use it to help Australian films. Proving his support for national culture in the early 1970s, he saved the Australian opera with a $250,000 donation. He returned to Australia from time to time to appear in local movies and made several attempts to get his own productions off the ground there. For many years he had high hopes of a project called Banjo Creek. He described it as a sort of African queen on a truck and intended that Maggie Smith might star in it. In John Powers' The Picture Showman, he and John Malan played rival projectionists who travel around the country, bringing the movies to far-flung places. In Stephen Elliott's 1997 Welcome to Whoop Whoop, he was the lewd and lurid daddy-o and almost stole the movie. Towards the end of the 1960s, he began transforming his image. Tiring of playing the romantic lead, he began to look for grittier roles, beginning with the Western Chucker, which he produced and helped write, and the war film Dark of the Sun. The 1970s and 80s were largely taken up with TV work, including Bearcats and The Oregon Trail. From 1988 to 1990, he appeared in the Dallas-inspired Californian wine industry soap Falcon Crest. He had retired from acting. Pretending to still be the tough man of action isn't dignified for me anymore, he said in 1987. There comes a time when you're over the hill, and there are plenty of great-looking younger actors who can take your place. When Quentin Tarantino tempted him back onto the big screen for a well-regarded cameo as Winston Churchill in Inglorious Bastards. Taylor, who had a lifelong interest in art, spending much of his spare time painting and making pottery, died of a heart attack at home following dinner with friends. His daughter, Felicia Taylor, who he had with his second wife, Mary Hylam, is a former anchor and financial reporter for CNN. Taylor's first marriage to Margaret Peggy Williams lasted from 1951 to 1954, when he left Australia. Taylor married longtime friend Carol Kikimura, previously an extra on Hong Kong in 1980. Taylor spoke in typically self-deprecating way about his career. I wasn't good-looking enough to pull off some of the roles I was put into, and so I was a little bit, sometimes insecure, playing all that kind of thing. That's why it's so wonderful for me now, being an ugly old dinosaur, to play an ugly old dinosaur, like I did just now. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Rod Taylor? He loved his work. Being an actor was his passion, calling it an honourable art and something he couldn't live without.